get to the point, and I may ask some questions just to make sure you got it too. So, just want to kind of re go through this and, and make sure we're clear because there's some, a lot of test questions on the profile, okay? So, we start out by telling you that Richard Nixon was born on January 9th, 1913 in Yorba Linda, California. He was the second of five sons born to Francis and Hannah Nixon. The Nixon family, who were staunch Quakers, moved to nearby Whittier, California in 1922. And Mr. Nixon, which would be Richard's father, opened up kind of a combination grocery store and gas station in Whittier. And we told you that Richard Nixon had several odd jobs as a teenager. He was a bean picker at the age of 10. He worked as a handyman. He worked as a janitor in a swimming pool. He worked as a barker at an amusement park, and he also worked at his dad's station. Remember I told you he made trips to Los Angeles for fresh produce daily at 4 a.m. and then got back in time to go to school. Okay, stop me if you're missing anything. We told you that Nixon attended three different elementary schools before graduating from Whittier High School in 1930. While in high school, he loved history, civics, played football, and starred in debate. He was a very well-rounded individual. He got involved in almost every group or organization he could in high school, eventually running for president of the group. And one of his longtime friends once quoted that he thought he had voted for Richard Nixon over 20 times for president of one thing or another, including president of the United States. He was named the best all-around student by his class at Whittier High School. He received a full tuition scholarship to Harvard University, but had to turn down the scholarship because he couldn't afford the room and board. We told you that Nixon's oldest brother, Harold, had contacted tuberculosis in 1930. His mother moved Harold to Arizona, where she cared for him and many other TB patients. This caused a tremendous burden to the family financially, and we told you that since Harold's illness put such a hardship on the Nixon family finances, that's why Nixon couldn't accept that scholarship to Harvard, and he actually entered Whittier College in the fall of 1930 at the age of 17. I did tell you that Harold eventually died on his mother's birthday in 1932 when Richard was 19 years old. At Whittier College, he was elected student body president right away. It was a very strict Quaker institute, and he kept his campaign promise to negotiate dancing on campus. We kind of compared that to the movie Footloose. Yep. Uh, he graduated as a four-year honor student from Whittier in 1934 and he earned a scholarship to Duke University School of Law, graduating in 1937, ranking third in a graduating class of 44. In 1937, the Great Depression was still gripping the United States, so when Nixon left college, there were few jobs available. He tried unsuccessfully to join both the FBI and a law firm in New York City. Finally, he returned home, joined a law firm in Whittier, and began his career as a local attorney. He soon met Thelma Patricia Ryan at a community theater play tryout. And we mentioned that Thelma was given the name, nickname Pat by her father because she was born on the eve of St. Patrick's Day, which it would have been last night, I guess, right? She was teaching at Whittier High School when she met Richard, and on their first date, Nixon stated to Pat, believe it or not, I'm going to marry you someday. The couple did marry on June 21st, 1940. They had two daughters, Patricia and Julie, and both daughters had the honor of being married in the White House when their father was president. We said that in September of 1942, Nixon joined the United States Navy. He served as a supply officer during World War II in the Pacific Ocean. He became a very successful poker player in the service, and he saved over $10,000 from his winnings in 1942-43, a lot of money. He used those winnings to finance his first political campaign. In 1946, he ran for a seat in the California House of Representatives against popular incumbent Jerry Voorhees. And we mentioned it was quite a risk for Nixon to give up a year of his life and his life savings to challenge a guy that maybe would beat him because he was very pow powerful. We mentioned with communism as big concern at this time in American history, Nixon hammered hard on that issue against Voorhees. He attacked his record in Congress. He labeled him soft on communism and just fell short of calling him a communist himself. And I told you that Nixon was kind of the first mudslinger in politics. 
His tactics worked to perfection. He was elected to the House by a large margin, defeating Voorhees. While serving in the House, he was appointed to a special committee, the House Committee on Un-American Activities. It was a group that investigated communist influence in the United States, and Nixon soon became involved with the investigation of a fellow by the name of Alger Hiss. And Hiss was a former State Department executive who had been accused of being a communist, and the person that accused him of being a communist was a guy by the name of Whitaker Chambers, who was the editor of Time magazine, and he was a former communist himself. And Chambers had testified that he and Hiss were close friends, and that Hiss was serving as a spy as well as a communist. So Chambers guided investigators to, mi to microfilm hidden in pumpkins on the editor's Maryland farm. Believe it or not, Chambers said the microfilm were pictures of files given to him by Hiss. I'll be darned if they didn't find microfilm in those pumpkins. It showed copies of State Department documents written in the 1930s, and many of them were written on Hiss's typewriter and in his handwriting. So he definitely got caught. How do you know what typewriter? You know, I, don't, I suppose the FBI can do lots of things like that. I don't know. Um, Nixon grabbed the spotlight as he was pushed. He pushed a guilty verdict on Alger Hiss. Hiss was found guilty, was sentenced to five years in prison, and this gave Nixon the, the chance he needed on the national spotlight. In 1950, he was finishing his second term in the House, and he announced he would run for the Senate. During the Senate campaign, he ran against Helen Douglas, who was considered a New Deal Democrat. In other words, she supported the policies of uh, Franklin Roosevelt, and she was very popular with the Hollywood crowd. During the campaign, Nixon emphasized that Douglas was too soft on communism, referred to her as the pink lady, and even stated publicly that she was pink all the way down to her underwear, which was kind of risky at that time. He even sent out copies of her voting record in the Senate, printed on pink pieces of paper. Well, she got a little upset, and she retaliated by stating that Nixon couldn't be trusted, and she gave him a nickname that he would not like, but would stay with him the rest of his political career, which was Tricky Dick Nixon. In one of the Senate's most heated political contests, Nixon defeated Douglas by almost 700,000 votes and became Senator of California. In 1952, he was nominated for the vice presidency by presidential hopeful Dwight Eisenhower, and two months before the campaign, the New York Post printed a story detrimental to Nixon's quest to be vice president. And the newspaper disclosed that Nixon had a secret $18,000 fund that was given to him from rich backers. Eisenhower was urged to dump Nixon as a liability as soon as that came out. Instead, Eisenhower arranged for television time so that Nixon could explain the accusations. And Nixon spoke on national television about the accusations and laid out his personal finances to the nation, which embarrassed his wife, Pat, tremendously. And during the speech, he stated, Pat doesn't have a mink coat, but she does have a nice cloth Republican coat. And he later went on to explain that the family did receive one gift from a political supporter, a cocker spaniel puppy. And Nixon commented on national television about that by saying, Tricia named it Checkers, and regardless of what they say about it, we're going to keep it. And in political history, this speech and this national television appearance became known as the Checkers speech. It was at the end of the speech that Nixon asked for the public for input on whether he should stay on the ticket or not. This angered Eisenhower because Eisenhower felt it was his decision to make, not the public's. He felt like Nixon was going over his head, but the move worked well. Eisenhower forgave him. Nixon received tremendous support to stay on the ticket. And he was elected vice president under Eisenhower in 1952 and 1956. He loses his bid for the presidency to John F. Kennedy in the election of 1960. And after his loss to Kennedy, he moved to Los Angeles to begin practicing law again. In 1962, he decided to run for governor of California. He thought he would win easily, a former vice president. He actually lost to a fellow by the name of Edmund Brown. It was a bitter, bitter loss for Nixon. He blamed the media for his loss, and in a statement to the media after the loss, he stated to the media, you don't have Nixon to kick around anymore. He reappeared, we know, in 1968, earning the Republican nomination for president. He went on to defeat Hubert Humphrey and George Wallace for the presidency and was re-elected in 1972. Is that where we ended, or did I tell you, did I tell you about his... Okay. 
So we'll continue on uh, with the rest of this profile on Nixon then. Um, because of his involvement in what we will learn later as the Watergate investigation, Nixon becomes the first president to resign from office. And, and he does so on August 9, 1974. So because of his involvement in the Watergate investigation, which we'll talk about, Nixon was forced to resign from office on August 9, 1974. Now, after he left office, he returned to California, and he really avoided politics. So after Nixon resigned the presidency, he returned to California and really avoided any participation in, in uh, politics at all. So what do, what do presidents normally do when they leave office? They write their memoirs, and that's what he did. And he published his memoirs in 1978, and they were entitled simply The Memoirs of Richard Nixon. I actually have two copies of that signed by Richard Nixon. They're worth some money. Anyway, in 1978, he published his memoirs entitled The Memoirs of Richard Nixon. M-E-M-O-I-R-S. M-E-M-O-I-R-S. 1978. So he left office in 74, he returned to California, avoided politics, began to write his memoirs, and they were published in 1978 entitled The Memoirs of Richard Nixon. In 1980, he moved to New York City. And then in 1981, he moved to Saddle River, New Jersey. So in 1980, Nixon moved from California to New York City, and then in 1981, he moved to Saddle River, New Jersey. What else was he working on besides his memoirs with some help of supporters during this time from 1974 until he moved to Saddle River, New Jersey? What else were they trying to figure out? What? What do most presidents get? Like something named after them. And what is it normally? Like a library. Library. So in 1990... The Richard Nixon Library opened in Yorba Linda, California. In 1990, the Richard Nixon Library opened in Yorba Linda, California. How do you spell that? It's on your sheet. It's on your sheet. Is it? So, from 1990, in the early 1990s, let me rephrase that. In the early 1990s, Richard and Pat Nixon enjoyed a busy retirement. That's what they did. He continued to travel. He continued to write. In the early 1990s, Richard and Pat were just enjoying themselves, having a busy retirement. Unfortunately, in June of 1993, Nixon's wife of 53 years died of lung cancer. So on, in June of 1993, Nixon's wife, Pat, they'd been married 53 years, died of lung cancer. How old was she? Oh boy, 53 years, I don't know how old she was. Well, she was in her 70s. But anyway, she was buried at the Richard Nixon Library. Both Richard Nixon and Pat Nixon are buried at a burial spot at the library in Yorba Linda. So in June of 1993, Nixon's wife of 53 years died of lung cancer and was buried at the Richard Nixon Library in Yorba Linda. For the next 10 months after her death, Nixon kept up a full schedule, including a famous trip to the Soviet Union in March of 1994. And you'll understand later why that was so famous. So for the next 10 months after Pat's death, Nixon kept up a full schedule, and in March of 1994, he made a very famous trip to the Soviet Union. March of 1994, he makes a famous trip to the Soviet Union. A month later, on April 22, 1994, a month after his trip to the Soviet Union, on April 22, 1994, Richard Nixon died in a New York hospital from a major stroke at the age of 81. So a month after his famous trip to the Soviet Union, on April 22, 1994, Richard Nixon died in a New York hospital 
of a major stroke at the age of 81. How old was he when he ran for president? 68, 94, 84, 74, 64, 30. He was about 50-ish in the 50s. Now, you know how many people attended Richard Nixon's funeral? You kind of think of him as kind of a schmuck. He really was a good president. Forty, over 40,000 people attended his funeral, including four former presidents and one president. So Nixon's funeral was attended by over 40,000 people, including former President Gerald Ford, who we'll still talk about, former President Jimmy Carter, former President Ronald Reagan, former President Orch, George H. Bush, excuse me, and President Bill Clinton. So Nixon's funeral was attended by over 40,000 people, including four former presidents, Ford, Carter, Bush, and Reagan, and President Bill Clinton. Very statesmanlike funeral, very, very formal. And like I mentioned before, Nixon is, was then buried next to his wife in Yorba Linda, California. Okay, that ends the notes. Now we're going to have a test review. And again, I want to give you this review today so that you'll have two, kind of two days to get yourself lined up because some of you have been gone a bit. Okay? So get in your notes. We've got a lot of time here. So we'll take it nice and slow and make sure you get it. Oh, I'm not sure yet. Okay, let's get to the assassination of Robert Kennedy and see if Tyler Tashima can tell me the three men and their professions that subdued Sirhan Sirhan after he shot Senator Kennedy. Now let's just look. We got a lot of time, so we don't need to hurry. So Tyler, give us those names and their professions. George Clinton, who is a journalist. Okay. Rafier Johnson. Rafer Johnson. Who is a gold medalist in the Catalan. Very good. And pro footballer Rosie Greer. Very good. You should know those men and their professions who subdued Sirhan Sirhan after he shot Senator Robert Kennedy. Okay, on the same area, Zach, tell the class who Andrew West was concerning... Robert Kennedy's assassination. Andrew West. I don't know. Don't know? Um, Brittany? Um, he was the one who recorded the scuffle after the assassination on his audio tape. Okay, and what was he? Do you remember? Mm, I oh, don't remember. Anybody know what he was? He was a reporter. He was a reporter. Yes, very good. Hit the scuffle audio. He had an audio recording of the scuffle following Kennedy's assassination. Okay, no one had a video, but he had an audio. Okay, he was a reporter who had an audio recording of the scuffle and, and the aftermath of Robert Kennedy's assassination. Where is that? Should be right after. Okay, Miss Butterfield, give me one of the three major campaign issues in the election of 1968. One of the three major campaign issues in the election of 1968. What, what they campaigned on. What were the issues? No, nope, that was Bobby Kennedy's thing. Sadie, give me one, then I think people get on track. The three major, give me one of the three major campaign issues in the election of 1968. Kylie? Vietnam. The Vietnam War was one. Okay, Annie, you got another one yet? The Vietnam War was one. Civil rights was one. And Sadie, how about the last one? The most important one was the last one. Uh, violence and disorder. Violence and disorder. Okay, so the three major campaign issues in 68. Civil rights, the Vietnam War, and violence and disorder. Okay. Bowdy, give me one of the three Democratic hopefuls for nomination during the election of 1968. One of the three men that was running for the Democratic nomination for President 68. Uh, um, Bobby Kennedy? No. 
he ends up being dead. So he doesn't oh, really. Oh, right. and it was. Uh... Shh. Zach. Uh, Eugene McCarthy of you, Minnesota. Senator Eugene McCarthy of Minnesota is one. Other one's on that Life magazine over there, Tyler. Who is that? George McGovern. George McGovern, Senator from South Dakota. Now, what did he He ran to keep what together, Bobby? What did Senator McGovern run to do? Uh, keep the Kennedy forces together. And who is the third candidate, uh, Sean? Hubert Humphrey. Hubert Humphrey, who is the present vice president. Okay. Okay. Phoenix, give me one of the three Republican hopefuls for nomination in 68. Nelson governor Nelson, former Governor Nelson Rockefeller of New York. Yep, how about another one, Augie? Richard Nixon comes back from a long time out of politics, so to speak. Richard Nixon, former Vice President. Bowdy, how about a third Republican? Um, Rockefeller? That said him. Oh. Mm. Said Nixon, this guy was kind of his new on the scene. Turns out to be a president in California. Ronald Reagan, very good. Okay. All right. Bobby, who is Lauren Coleman? And what did he have to do with the Kennedy assassination, the Bobby Kennedy assassination? Who is Lauren Coleman? Had more to do with Sirhan's motives. Who is Lauren Coleman? Uh, he's the author who stated that it was the first act of Iranian terrorism to take place on American soil. Okay, what was? Of uh, the assassination. Okay, I would, I would word it more that Sirhan Sirhan's shooting of Bobby Kennedy was what his opinion, the first terrorist action on American soil by the Arabs. Yep. Who is Kenneth Keating? Kellen, who is Kenneth Keating? Had more to do with uh, Bobby Kennedy's profile. Who is Kenneth Keating? Kenneth Keating, Bobby Kennedy's profile. He's a man that Bobby Kennedy ran against and defeated for the senatorial position or senatorial seat in New York. He was an incumbent, very popular, and Bobby Kennedy defeated Kenneth Keating in the senatorial race of New York. Okay, now I need a good explanation here, and Carly, I think you're just the gal to give it to us. What was Hubert, or excuse me, what was George Wallace's political philosophy for the election of 1968? What was his political philosophy? How did he think he could win the election? What was the political philosophy for victory in the election of 1968 from the perspective of Governor George Wallace of Alabama? Wasn't he the one that thought he'd get it in the House? Okay, explain that process. You're right. I did not write it down, but he... Okay, you're going to have to know this, so let's talk about this. Carly is right. He thought he could win in the House, but how do you get to the House, Blake? Uh, there's, like, no winner. Okay, what's that mean? No one, no one gets what of the electoral vote? Two-thirds two majority. If no one gets two-thirds majority in the electoral college in a presidential election, then it goes to the House, and the House decides the new president. They vote. And Wallace thought that he could keep both Nixon and Humphrey from getting two-thirds majority of electoral votes, which would throw the election into the hands of the House of Representatives for a vote, and he thought he had enough support in the House to win the election. That was his philosophy. He knew he could not win outright. But he really did believe, and it was pretty good political philosophy, that that could happen. Because nobody was very excited about either candidate. Unfortunately, that didn't happen for him. All right. Let's see here. I'll go back. I'll go to Bobby again. Bobby, give me one example of the mudslinging on the part of Richard Nixon and Helen Douglas can be either in that hotly contested California Senate race of 1950. Give me one example of mudslinging that either candidate did. I guess the kid, the pink lady down your underwear thing. Okay, actually that's two. Nixon did what? Be specific. What did Nixon do in mudslinging? How do you mudslinger? Called her pink lady. 
Why? Uh, Very good. How about that other one? Give me that other one you said. He also said publicly what? That she was her right down to her underwear. Okay, how about another one? Caitlin, I, I'm not sure what you got. You got another one. Give me another mudslinging on either part. She called him tricky dick. Because she, uh, because she said people could not um, trust, trust him. him yeah. Okay, how about another one? I think there's one more I think you could give me. Phoenix, do you remember it or? One more thing that Nixon did. Basically, she just did the one. He, oh, he printed off. Her voting record in Congress on paint paper. Okay, Brandy. Who did Nixon lose to during the governorship of California in 62? Who defeated Nixon in the governor's race in 1962 of California? He didn't think he'd lose to this guy, but he did. I'll find it. I can't okay. read my handwriting because you're speaking. Okay. Is it Edmund Brown? Edward Ed, Brown? Edmund Brown. Edmund Brown. Very good. Okay. What was the significance, Brittany, of Richard Nixon's poker plane while in the United States Navy? Um, he saved up to 18,000. Nope. Oh, you're right. What'd you say? He saved up to eighteen thousand dollars. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say that. One more time. What was the significance of Nixon's poker plate while at the United States Navy prison? I know he's. I don't remember the exact amount. He saved enough money which he used on his first campaign. Okay, there's the answer I'm looking for. The two things I'm looking for. He saved, but you got to tell me how much. He saved ten thousand dollars that he used to finance his first political campaign. It's going to ask you for two things there. One of them is, one is he saved $10,000, and two, the second significance is he used it in his first political campaign. Okay? Uh, Tyler, the famous speech Richard Nixon gave when defending himself during the election of 1952 is known as the checker speech. Very good. All right. I'm going to ask you five extra credit questions, also worth a point apiece. So you might want to kind of dig deep in your notes and look at some things like where people are from, what some percentages were of people that believe this or that, uh, know a little bit more about the election of 68, know some quotes from Richard Nixon, things like that. So I'll ask you five extra questions that have to do with that. Okay? Now, Somebody would hit the lights back there. I'm going to start this assassination of Bobby Kennedy. This is pretty short, but it gives you the exact media as it was that day. How about somebody get the curtains? That'd be awesome. Now, there could be questions on the test just so you know, off of this video. So be paying attention. Or there could be questions of extra credit or both off of this video. Did you see that little disclaimer? It said, information given on this video may not still be accurate today because they're reporting on the scene. So there may be some things on here that aren't accurate, but it's pretty good. Hello, I'm Charles Gibson. Welcome to The Day It Happened, where we show you how the events that shaped the world unfolded. Today we're going to travel here. back to 1968, when Robert Kennedy was gunned down in a Los Angeles hotel while campaigning for the presidency. Great for Johnson right there. So I thank, I thank all of you who made this possible this evening. All of the effort that you made and all of the people whose names I haven't mentioned, but who made all, did all of the work at the precinct level, who got out the vote, who did all of the effort to brought forth all of the emphasis required. I was a campaign manager eight years ago. I know what a difference that kind of an effort and that kind of commitment made. So I thank all of you. The old of you are here. Mayor, Mayor 
Mary, your audience just sent me a message that we've been here too long already. <laughs> okay. My thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. So Ken, Senator Kennedy finishes his speech, his last public speech. He now goes away. Now remember, this is this is not a report of it. This is as they report it live then. That's Roosevelt Greer behind him and Mrs. Kennedy on, on the right-hand side of the screen. And Kennedy now shakes a few hands, turns his back, and goes off the podium. The Greer, one of his two bodyguards, and who holds him in the car when the uh, crowd try to pull him out by shaking his hand. But remember again, there's no live footage of him in the kitchen, so they're going to stay right out here, and then the word's going to come. So you'll have to just watch it. And Rayford Johnson's another Rayford Johnson went into that kitchen with him. Kennedy now disappears off the podium, goes out the back way into that kitchen where, if you listen closely, you can hear a sound like a cap pistol going off, just a, a little pop. And uh, then there's a, a long cover. And after about 60 seconds, you hear another... I guess he is reporting this out. We're still not clear what happened. So this is that, that shot from the kitchen. that was a shot and didn't hear another one for 60 seconds. Does that seem accurate to you? No, so just keep watching. I realized the senator had been shot. I, I felt he had. 
Reynolds, an ABC reporter, you will see his grave site in Arlington. He's buried in Arlington next to Joe Lewis, the boxer. And just kind of keep that in mind when we get there. You'll see his... his man name. referred to there, the suspected uh, assailant, is in custody. He may have been shouting at the time of the actual shooting, but apparently the police say he had made no statement as yet. The... The tension, of course, is centered right now on the Good Samaritan Hospital in Los Angeles. And let's go there now to Bob Clark. We have been waiting outside the hospital of the Good Samaritan now for over three hours. And apparently Senator Kennedy has been on the operating table for more than two hours. The last medical bulletin we received on his condition was over two hours ago, just a few minutes before he was scheduled to go into the operating room. We were told at that time that a team of a half dozen neurosurgeons would operate on the senator. He was unconscious. His condition was described then as very critical. The operation was to remove the small caliber bullet that lodged in the senator's brain after entering his right mastoid bone. We have received no further word from anyone inside the hospital since that time. Something like 75 or 100 reporters and photographers gathered across the street from the hospital as you can see, a cordon of police standing guard at the hospital door. A number of the Kennedy aides are inside the hospital, including this press secretary, Frank Mankiewicz, who gave us that last medical bulletin. There have been reports that operations of this sort can take up to four hours, so this may still be a long vigil. We repeat at the time of that last medical bulletin, the senator's condition and the wound, the bullet that lodged in his brain were both described as very critical. This is Bob Clark at the Hospital of the Good Samaritan. Bob Clark, correspondent that just filed that report from outside the Good Samaritan Hospital, was present in Dallas on November 22, 1963, when Senator Kennedy's older brother was struck down. How about that? I think we're ready now to go back to Washington and pick up a report there on reaction in the capital city from ABC Sam Donaldson. Frank, Washington is just waking up now. As you know, it's about 7.35 here in the East. People are getting the news by turning on their radios and television sets, and instead of finding cartoons and music, they're hearing this. Official Washington heard much earlier. President Johnson was awakened by Walt Rostow, who had gotten the news from the White House Situation Room just a few minutes after the shooting occurred. It's reported that Mr. Johnson has been watching television for some part of the morning since he received the news, and he is now conferring with aides at the White House in uh, sessions designed to see precisely what the government can do in the tragedy such as the one that may be developing in California. There's actually not much the government can do. Ramsey Clark, uh, on the uh, orders of the president, has uh, asked the FBI to step into the case. Who's and Ramsey Clark? The civil right? Who's Ramsey Clark if he asked the FBI to step in? What? Secretary of State. FBI, Department of Justice. Ironically, he took this guy's position. Is he the Attorney General? He's the Attorney General that replaced Bobby Kennedy. Exactly. For the past few years, particularly the one of 1964, that uh, Robert Kennedy helped shepherd through Congress as the then Attorney General to find a way for the federal government to enter the case, for the FBI to get into the case. Because as you know, an assassination attempt, an act of violence in one of the states is not a federal crime. It is only a state crime. But on the strength of the Civil Rights Act, the FBI has now been dispatched to investigate the uh, assassination attempt of Senator Kennedy. See, I'm having a hard time picking that up. What they're saying is that because Bobby Kennedy was killed in a state, it's not a federal crime. Because he's, he's not a federal employee of, the, of Washington, D.C. He's a senator. But 
They're using the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to enlist the help of the FBI. I just I'm have to look into that. I can't figure out what the what the Civil Rights Act of 64 would have to do with that. But anyway, that's what he's saying there. Okay. All right. We're going to stop there. We'll finish this tomorrow. Um, if you girls that were gone and stayed cheerily and have some questions about all those notes on the profile, I'd be happy to help you sometime when you come in, whatever. Somebody hit the lights there. And we're going to watch some video tomorrow. Test Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, more video. And then we'll get back to business on Monday when everything settles down just a little bit. Any questions at all? I think I've got to turn this thing off. <laughs>